what was special, you know, getting a record deal maybe would seem like really important however many years ago. And right. now maybe, like you said, getting a million streams on Spotify feels, or maybe now that's not even a thing anymore. Like, right. you know, what that marker is of being like, I won the part or I'm, I'm good yeah. and established, that keeps changing. Yes. And so it's very frustrating if you're going to define it by these other things. Like, right. I almost think these new things that come out, like if a new, not Spotify, but the new whatever is next mm -hmm. for music, it's like you have to go like, well, that's just a tool. Am I going to use it or not? Not so much like, is mm -hmm. this, a you know, like, oh, that's the new thing. I have to chase it. Welcome to the New Music Business Podcast. I am your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. Today, my guest is the multifaceted, multi-talented Emily Kinney. Most people know Emily Kinney as an actress. Uh, she starred in The Walking Dead from 2011 to 2015. She's also been on Masters of Sex, The Flash, Arrow, movies, other TV shows, Law & Order, just to name a few. She's also been on Broadway. She was in Spring Awakening and August Osage County. She also just launched a podcast of her own, called My Caffeine Withdrawal, where she interviews musicians and actors and other friends like Fantagram, K. Flay, Josh Radner, local natives. She's also, obviously, a very talented musician. That's why she's on the show. Today, we kind of go in a different direction than most of these episodes go. We do touch on the business, but we also straddle the line of how acting relates to music and how music relates to acting, both in the creative sense and in the business sense. We talk about the differences in both and the learning curves of both. She has many releases to her name, so she has a lot of experience with the business of music alongside being an actress. I really enjoyed our conversation. I learned a lot. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me. Someone who has dipped their toes into the Hollywood acting pond, that is probably something most of you don't know about me. Find me on IMDb, you'll see. But don't look up any of those parts, please. <laughs> Actually, you can look up my part on Mad Men. I'm pretty proud of that one. Anyway, follow this show. Subscribe to it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or YouTube, please leave a comment or a review. Those really help. You can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Ari Herstand. You can find all of us at Ari's Take. Also find Emily. She is on Twitter and Instagram at Emily Kinney. Visit Ari'sTake.com to subscribe to the email list. If you're not on the email list, get on there. You'll be notified about future episodes, but also anything that's happening in the new music business of note, I send out to the email list. Get on that list. All right, let's kick into the show. Emily Kinney, welcome yes. to the show. Thank you for having me. I was yeah, excited to get a, to chat with you. Me yeah. too. You know, um, is this your first, uh, like, digital podcast uh, conversation zoom meeting or are you doing like seven zoom meetings a day like I've been doing <laughs> um I've been yeah I've been doing a lot of zoom meetings yeah but um I haven't done a lot yet where it's well actually I did one other one where it was like a recorded podcast mm. zoom okay because yeah. you, have you been following the, the guy because I'm like I've been jealous I've been following your uh your podcast series yeah and all these photos are you and these awesome people together <laughs> and you're like you released one last week I'm like what's how are you doing this are you quarantining beforehand and then getting tested and then come together or is this from yeah. like pre-quarantine lockdown that you had all these things recorded yeah it, it was pre pre-lockdown. So I was kind of oh, lucky okay. that I had, I had started this project actually before Christmas and I knew oh. I didn't want it to be something where it was like, okay, every week I have to do it at this time for me, yes. just because like, I feel like I always have auditions popping up or, and sure. I also was just creating the show. So, mm. um, and yeah, every week was different. Like some week I would have like two people and then the next week, you know, no one, or mm -hmm. sometimes we do two in one day. And so I was just kind of like figuring out what the show was. So we just started yeah. recording them. Um, we did like a couple before Christmas time and then really started getting into it like January, February, cool. March. And then um, we had two more scheduled actually for like season one. Yeah. And they 
obviously got canceled. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. But so, so I haven't... had already been like putting it together. Um, yeah. And then, and then, yeah. So during this quarantine time though, we've done things like add, you know, add little intros or like mm-hmm. uh, making the video content, put that, putting that together and stuff. Yeah. I mean, so. it's, it's quite a production. It's cool how you've done that. Um, and you know, we, like we started this show also launched it in March. Uh, and so recorded, gosh, maybe 10 or maybe 10 episodes before, uh, lockdown. And so those are, we had finally gotten it to the point where like everything worked out. We got the cameras working. We got the like live mixer fader things happening. We had the mics all, it was like, great. We had the location. Everything was perfect. We finally got it down by like the 10th episode. And then we're like, all right, it's all going online now. So now it was a totally different, you know, project to figure out how this thing works. Um, I'm curious, what inspired you to launch a podcast? Um... Well, a couple of things. Um, first of all was the producer, Rob, was someone that I had been friends with for quite a while. I met him doing a different podcast, Michael Rosenbaum's um, podcast. Mm. And we kind of stayed in touch and touch. And there were different times when we would talk about like, oh, maybe we would do like a music video together. Or maybe mm-hmm. we just like always kind of um, clicked in a certain way. And it was like, okay, mm-hmm. what project are we going to work on together? Something will like align. Cool. And, um, I had also been having this idea of like wanting to do maybe a blog or something about like coffee shops and that I love because I love coffee. And, you know, when you're touring, you're always like trying out new coffee shops and there's that. And then, um, yeah, I guess sometimes I can feel a little isolated, like Mm -hmm. being an an artist. Like I do a lot of my writing just kind of on my own, at least the beginning stages. And, I think I just, I'm such a music fan, Mm. like first in a way that I was like, I really want to like meet all of my favorite bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a a easy way to do it. So, so I was like, so it's like, how do I like, you know, meet my favorite bands or talk to my friends who are also artists and, um, uh, the main I guess goal of it and concept was kind of like what inspires you and what makes you want to get out of bed. Because Mm. for me, I I have had a lot of um, ups and downs, like emotionally, you know, as all artists do. And there, there have been days, you know, where there's nothing to do. And I'd sort of be like, well, what's, what am I doing today? Like what gets me out of bed? And Mm -hmm. or like, what cures my caffeine withdrawal? You know, and it's like right. coffee, coffee always. <laughs> that's easy. That's coffee. yeah, coffee. And then also like I do this thing where I listen to a lot of music just on my iPhone in bed, mm. and it's like till I hear the right song that makes me want to get out of bed. Mm. So it became like music and wow. coffee is the thing that inspires me. And then I wanted to talk to other artists like what you know about morning routines and. Mm-hmm what makes them keep making music and Mm -hmm. inspires them, you know? I love that you're a music fan first. I mean, I I love that you're still a music fan. And I guess we're all music fans, but being in the industry so long, a lot of people get jaded and and can sometimes lose their love of music and, and sometimes forgetting the reason we got into music in the first place was because of the love. Like, there's no reason yeah. that uh, anyone within their right mind would choose such an unstable, crazy career path uh, without that that unwavering love. Uh, but then after a while, I think a lot of people lose track of why they're actually doing it. And it just becomes something that they they now just do because they, they just all they know how to do or they built up a life and a career. And I've, I, you know, I can't tell you how many musicians I've spoken to. I'm like, oh, what are you listening to today? And they list, they list ten different podcasts. I'm like, do you listen to music anymore? It's like, actually, not really. <laughs> like, yeah. oh man, that's so sad. <laughs> but like, I get it. And then it's like, you know, especially when you're working on a record or something like that, um, can be very, uh, you know, single-minded focus in in just kind of keeping. Uh, within the vision and sometimes you're just overloaded with music but I I love to hear that you you still do you listen to music most mornings is that part of your morning routine um it sometimes morning routine sometimes um 
like I said, more like if I'm having trouble getting out of bed. But I I listen to a lot of music at night, especially I noticed during this quarantine going back to just like, I I just like will just like lay in bed until I feel tired and just like go through like an an album um, or something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, But I definitely relate to what you're saying about how like when it starts to become your job, you're like, Mm -hmm. now you're listening to music as like, oh, well, I need my song to sound like this or like, it becomes about the thing that you're creating instead of just like what, like reacting to something that sparks you or, you know, you, you yeah. stop kind of like listening to it as like the one who gets to enjoy it and consume it. And, and then, mm-hmm. and then in turn makes you want to, you're like, Oh, I want to make a song too. You know? Yeah. Like I find that to be more uplifting than like, I know what you mean about the, like getting into a mode where you're like only listening to your own stuff or listening sure. for like for knowledge and a reason to help well, your career, yeah, you know, which is important, yes. but I find it it's after a while. Yeah. It can kind of make you, you know, bogged down and you're like, Oh, I'd rather not yeah. listen to music. I'd rather like watch well, TV. Totally. Or I mean, I, I feel like, you know, uh, especially preparing, like I'm just finishing a record right now and, pre- and for the last few months and preparing for it, the only stuff I was listening to was listening for a specific purpose to see how if, if there was anything in there that I could pull for inspiration in terms of like production standards or it's like oh the artists that I'm digging lately it's like oh how are they and I'm I'm listening very critically and it's yeah. like less about an enjoyment and it's a different style of listening and I, you know, I, I sometimes just want to get back. I guess the way that I, I can listen to music for enjoyment that I know I dig um, and get out of my head is I'll just get stoned. And then that's like my <laughs> favorite way to listen to music. Yeah. Then I'm just like, woo, float away. <laughs> yeah. It's totally just to have like a nice like moment and like just yes. enjoy your evening and not like be like in work mode or something. Right. That's great. Yeah. So it's, it can be so critical. So. Um, so you have a well. By the time this this episode comes out, your new song "Easy" uh, is out. Yeah. Um, when did you record that? And tell me about the recording process and kind of the the story behind that song. Yeah, um, that song I actually wrote quite a while ago, but mm. it's the first of a whole album that I'll be releasing. Um, oh, nice. So first of a bunch of singles. Okay. Um, and I recorded everything actually basically in this room in my house, mm, cool. um, with, with my friend, with my friend, Ben Greenspan. And, um, the, uh, when I first decided to make the album, I was just finishing up touring with my last album, Oh Jonathan. And I actually had ended the tour a bit early and mm-hmm. was actually not feeling inspired <laughs> at all to make yeah. music. Um, because I think, you know, after a tour, sometimes you can feel kind of worn down and maybe yeah. it didn't meet all the the things I had set for myself, you know, and sure. kind of like not really like, huh, wh- where should I put my focus? And um, so I basically didn't, I came back actually and cut the tour short, mostly because um, an actor friend of mine had passed away. Mm. And I, so I came home, I didn't have anything on the schedule because originally I was supposed to be touring and I just Mm -hmm. like didn't do anything for, I mean, now we know what that's like all the time, but (laughs) like I just didn't do anything for like a week and I was like, huh, I don't even know if I want to, like what's the next step for music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I just came up with a song that was about my friend and then that kind of became the concept for, and I didn't know the name of the album yet, but that kind of became the concept for the whole record, which was just about more my life because he was an actor kind of mentor of mine. Like Mm. my more reflect songs reflecting on, uh, my life as like an actor and an artist and auditioning and things like that. So Mm. easy was one that was a poem I had written a while back. Um, and it was inspired. It sounds like it's about, um, a like, romantic relationship but it's it was more inspired by and there's things from relationships that I that I draw from in the lyrics that are from real like relationships I had but it's supposed to be more about how like you know when you're an actor you want to be like the easy one to work with or Mm. like you know um it talks a lot about like oh from Atlanta to this place like I'll go wherever to get like the next job and like there's there's a there's a line that says like 
um, I'll go to Greenpoint Avenue and there's this casting office that you have to take like, th- this is when I lived in New York. You have to take like three trains yeah. to get to, walk yeah. in the cold, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right, I mean, right. I'm not complaining. I'm so happy for an audition. <laughs> but exactly, right, that's right, that's right. exactly the thing where like you feel like you got to be easy. You got to be like yeah. easy to work with and like, hmm. and um, you don't, as, as much as there's like, uh, like I do, I do feel like sometimes there's that like oh who was that how was that person to work with were they like a diva or you know you feel very replaceable. So I'm I'm curious about that because I mean I I'm not in the acting world anymore uh, very much um, and I I don't know the acting world uh, very well and a lot of people listening don't really don't know the acting world but we hear yeah. the headlines and you know the is that person easy to work with I, I'm I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, like for one, where does that come from? Why, like what happens if you're not easy to work with? What does that even mean? And also like, I've also heard that can be kind of, um, I mean, not to go down this realm route completely, but like, you know, uh, during when, um, kind of the, the Harvey Weinstein, um, Me Too movement was started and, and all of his thing came out, like he would, black you know it was it was came, it came out that he would blacklist people around town saying like she's not easy to work with she's a, yeah you know, she's a terror and you, she's gonna be challenged and it's like you know I, I feel like the easy to work with could sometimes be deemed sexist as as kind of like is that thrown towards men and women equally or do you find that that's something that's just uh you know used against women um i think I think it's more so women. It's funny that you brought that up because I was having a conversation with an actress friend of mine just last week. And we were talking about a time on set where a coworker had, it was really, really hot that day. And she had just sort of, um, you know, thrown off a thing and been like, oh my God, it's so hot. Plus it was like a very emotional scene. And a different male coworker had come up to me and said, and said, oh my gosh, I'm really worried about so-and-so because like, and she, you know, and I was like, oh, why? I was like, well, you know, she can't be acting like that. She can't be like whatever. And I thought it was interesting because it was such an emotional scene and, Mm -hmm. or constantly emotional scene. And many of the other male coworkers, I feel like they could easily be like, oh, and like throw something. It wasn't like she said anything mean or, you know, just kind of like an attitude of like, I'm frustrated. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do feel like if like, and I had seen it on many sets, like if a male, a uh, coworker is acts in that way a little more frustrated. I do think there's a higher standard for the women to be really good at your job, be able to be emotional in the moment, but then also just like, okay, cut. Okay, now I'm going to be, but that's not really how acting works for me anyway. Sure. It's yeah. not always, yeah. you know, you can't, I mean, I'm, I definitely think that on a set, it is better to be easy to work with. You have so many moving parts. Sure. And ultimately, like, you are fitting into someone's bigger picture. You know, it's like if you're the artist and you're hiring your band, sure. you know, you want the guitar player to be or the drummer. You hired them and you're paying them and it's your project. Yeah. And you, it is a collaboration, but ultimately, you know, if they're difficult on tour, you're not going to want that drummer. And it's the totally reality right. is, like, the actor, even though it's their face on screen – they're still fitting into like a producer, director's, maybe network's bigger mm-hmm. picture. So so I do think it's important to be easy to work with, but like I do, but there's also this like, you're an artist and there is mm-hmm. a sense of, well, when do I stand up for myself? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and like you, like you pointed out and like I was having the conversation last week with my female friend about like, mm-hmm. there does seem to sometimes be this like different standard for me as opposed to you know, my male coworkers. Sure. And I, I mean, I remember what bring what comes to mind uh, is that uh, cl- I, uh, that Christian Bale clip of when he was on the set of Batman and he was berating uh, one of the lighting people because they got in the scene or, or something like that. Like it was got like in the a, line of sight, sight something line. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it came out, but it was kind of, I think just like overall it was accepted is like well he's an artist and that's just what the process and you don't want to mess with the process whereas like you don't i don't feel like we as a society or even maybe an industry tend to excuse that behavior from women as much um 
And like you said, when the scene, when you yell cut, you're expected to just like be easy to work with professional. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, it's, it's interesting because I think just being an artist, um, you know, you throw so much of yourself into it that it's, it's hard to turn on and off. Like I, I even with, with songwriting, um, you know, I remember there's one day when I was writing um, in the writing phase of this record, uh, after a full day of writing here at my place, um, you know, my, my friend came over uh, for dinner that night and he, I, I opened the door to him mm -hmm. and he's like, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Are you all right? What, what's wrong? Like he could sense <laughs> it immediately. Yeah. And it was just because I was in that mode of writing that day and it was a really heavy, intense topic um, that I was writing about. And it's hard to shut that off. Um, now, do you find, I'm curious because you, because you are an actor and a musician and a songwriter and a poet, like you're an artist in the complete sense of the world and in many different, through many different mediums. Um, I'm, I'm curious if, if the way that you are as an artist if there are similarities between the different mediums with songwriting, does any of the bit of like, how yeah. do you operate as an artist with acting versus songwriting versus performing and, and that realm? Yeah. I mean, I find acting when you're, when you are taking on a character, mm -hmm. I do feel like you're always bringing yourself to it. And mm. in that way, you're revealing parts of yourself that maybe people didn't see. Like, I think that we all have this range of people we are. Like, you are maybe sure. a little different around certain friends. Or like, you know, mm. your mom brings out this side of you. Your brother brings out the side of you that's more competitive. You are, you know what I mean? I don't know if you have a brother. I'm just yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like you know, brother, actually, but you yeah. know, okay. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like, you know how they bring out, or in this situation, you become more the leader. In this situation, yes. you become. So um, I think when I go into characters, you know, sometimes it's revealing a, another part of myself hmm. um just in the way of when I write a song sometimes I feel like I'm revealing like my side of the story or maybe hmm. I'm revealing a part of myself that you know like that's petty maybe I'm hmm. revealing a, that, a part of myself that's hopeful which sometimes I'm not always like sometimes I do sure. feel like within my songs I take on it's always um me but i'm taking on a um a specific point of view and then also i mean if you listen to my songs like the story is a big part of it yes and and i i do feel like i have the same and it's something that's been revealed to me like over time and i'm sure mm -hmm. my like if i have like a mission statement as sure. where that ties them all together you know mm -hmm. it's that i really like to reveal the sort of like everyday things as human beings mm -hmm. and when you make them into a song or when you put them on stage then they become more special so it's just which avenue are you picking are are you picking television are you picking a song for right. these stories so but where they kind of like come from in me is a very similar place i guess that is interesting that um i think a lot of people who aren't actors uh might not think that uh, what actors are doing is actually coming from a place inside them, that they're just really good at uh, portraying characters or embodying another character. And it's like a completely, uh, it's it's like just a craft. Um, and it's interesting because I, I look at um, even songwriting on the spectrum. On one extreme is craft and the other extreme is, is art. And you can kind of see like, in, in with songs, it's like, you know, there are some pure art songs and mm -hmm. it, it, we have the, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, maybe a, a 14 minute uh, Coltrane song is, is that's just the art just like pouring out and like, yes, he's following changes and all that stuff. Or maybe even like a Sigur Rós or a Bon Iver, some of these, you know, like you get into the real arty realm. Um, and that is what they're, that's the art. And then on the other extreme, you have the craft and that's like a lot of the country songs or a lot of pop songs that are written by maybe four or five, written by committee basically. And they're so good at their craft. And not to say that there's no art in that because there is art that goes into it, but it's, it's such a craft. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you, if there is that similar kind of spectrum when it comes to acting, um, in, in, if, do you find that? the art that's part of it is more holistic 
or do you find that some characters uh, you really have to turn on your craft and it's less about channeling uh, your artistry through that character uh, and more about just turning that craft on and trying to portray that character? That's a really good question. I mean, yeah, I, I agree that there's a spectrum like that in in acting as well. And, you know, craft is really important. When you learn about, like, theater, there's a certain um, tricks that you can learn, you know, mm. and, and ways that you want to direct the audience eyes and how you cheat out and so that mm. they get the story. And there's a craft and there's um, technique, you know, mm -hmm. so that you're heard properly. And mm -hmm. same thing with camera work. There's technique that you learn as you go along mm -hmm. and you get better. And so even if you're the most amazing actor, if, you know, you're not seen, well, then, you know, if your face, then they can't see you. And sure. maybe that's what you want or, you know, like it's a choice. But your technique gets better and your craft as an... And, and like you said, there are actors, I think, that are sort of that are that do go like physically first they go outward in more you know um I guess like outward like they're like imitating or or creating like the body the way the this character is going to talk all of mm. those things um first like the physical first and sure. if you go into um like all the different there's lots of different processes like different ways to learn acting like um, you know, like the Meisner, so the Meisner like there's, method, there's right, all these right, different, yeah, yeah. so there's all these different methods, um, yeah. of like different ways of approaching. And for me, um, you know, every character is different. So like you said, there are ones where it's like, mm. well, I have to learn how this character talks and, mm. um, then that will inform some of those inside things too. Or like if you are given a script, usually there is a really the more I say the word, sometimes that informs like like more of, oh, where does this hit me? Where, what can I bring to it? So mm. depending on each, or sometimes, you know, maybe the page doesn't offer as much and I'm going to create, well, who do I know that's like this? Like one thing that I'll do a lot is if, if I read a script and I say like, oh my gosh, this reminds me of my little sister. So mm. I'm gonna, certain mannerisms, I'm gonna kind of steal from her. And so you are crafting an, a picture mm -hmm. but ultimately like it helps me to feel like well you know why is it me and not someone else playing this character and like you bring up you bring yourself to it you know that's that's a really interesting part because um point you bring up why is it me and not somebody else playing this character and you know, with a um, with a show or a movie or a play, um, any of these roles, mm -hmm. they are awarded or given to or, or won by one person, one actor. One actor is going to play this role, and if it's you, it's not all these other people that audition for that role. Yeah, um, it's very different in music, whereas everybody can write a song. Everyone can make a record and everyone can put out their record and, and tell whatever story that they want to tell. And it's so fascinating to me because like, you know, yes, with music, there's imposter syndrome. Absolutely. Because, um, you know, any musician could come on and be like, well, why me? Why should people care about me? There's so much other better music out there. And that's a whole other topic. But with acting, I would say even more so it's like, you know, are, are there... Are there ever moments, and maybe not anymore because um, you're so much more established now, where you get a role, you get an audition for a, a, a part, and you're like, you know what, like, sure, I'm going to give it my all, but like, I don't think this is for me. And I, I would feel, I don't know, guilty is the right word, but I uh, I know that there are better actresses out there that would, would um, do a better mm. job at this role. Um, well, there's times definitely when I've auditioned for things, when I've been like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know, you know, where like, if I go like, huh, I don't know if I know someone like this. I don't know if mm. this, like, I'm not sure how this person, like I've definitely had auditions that like stumped me or, okay. um, or where I could read the script and imagine someone and maybe, maybe it wasn't me, but I guess, I guess that's part of, the fun of it is like, mm. you know, 
we'll work on it till it is you. And, uh, you know, yeah. like everyone, you know, any, anyone could play some of these, these parts, but then the director or producer goes, goes, okay, but how does it make sense with the person they're playing opposite? How does it make sense in terms of the family? And, right. you know, like, and sometimes you never know, like you might mm -hmm. think you're wrong for it. And then just like, I feel like when you write a song and you're like, like I've done this before where I've written something like real shitty. And then yeah. I like randomly, I'm like, oh yeah, I wrote this thing and I'll give it to my friend Ben. And then he's like, this is amazing. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and I think uh, that same thing can happen. I mean, I, I feel like that often where I'm like, wow, I had like a day to learn this, especially when you go into auditions. I don't know yet who this is, but sure. ultimately I'm going to still go in and and then you work it out, you know, like, yeah. um, yeah. but I think that's the fun of it is mm. when, I mean, yeah, when you like hear, that. when you hear like actors that get more of, cause I feel like I'm still, I don't know when you get more of a choice, they're like, I want stuff that's different, challenging, yeah. because that's part of the fun is like figuring that person out sure, and sure. like, yeah. And, and, and not getting to live. Keep, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Right. Well, no, just like Sorry. not just taking the roles that are just like you or that people expect you to be or that you've mastered because yeah. maybe you're you've like mastered telling that story it's like Jennifer Aniston doing every rom-com for like a like 10 years or something you know it's like yeah. it's like okay we get it like she, she's mastered telling that story and she's fantastic at it and then she's like you know what like i want to try to tell some other stories um and and i think uh it's yeah i know i i i understand that that's that's cool um in terms of uh, like now dipping, because this is this is very fascinating, interesting with like the craft and the art yeah. and how they connect with each other, and and with the acting realm, film industry, and with like music, but now getting into like the business of it all, because yeah. um, you know, you are a working actress, uh, you, uh for gosh, uh, like the last 10, 15 years or so, um, yeah. Yeah, I think fifteen. I was fifteen like, years. Yeah. Um, and you started. Um, well, after college, uh, you went to New York. Uh, mm -hmm. you did the Broadway thing for a minute, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You were on Spring Awakening, weren't you? Yeah. Were you in the I, cast with uh, Kyle Riabko? Oh yeah, only for uh, a few weeks though. I I replaced um, I replaced Phoebe who played Anna and uh -huh. Phoebe Stroll and um, but he was still on it for. A few more weeks before Hunter Parrish came on to play sure. Malcor. Right. Um, yeah, so I Kyle, was, yeah. I oh, was with fun. him. Do you know his music at all? Did you like did you um, get into his music? Do you know he's a like super talented singer songwriter and like yeah. for years before that? Yeah. Yeah, I remember us one night going to one of his shows, I feel like, like at yeah. Rockwood or something. Um, yeah. yeah. It was funny because like I had just played a show with him in Minnesota. I was living in Minnesota. We had just shared a bill together. Uh, it was like, I was placed on as like the local opener. He was touring through or something. And so I was just like the local opener and we played the show, but we hit it off. It was cool. And, um, you know, and then like a month or two later, I was in New York and just like, we were just going down the current show list and like watching the, uh, like Tony performances on YouTube. It's like, oh, this looks fun. This looks fun. And, uh, we're like, oh, Spring Awakening. They did the bitch of living on the, like, the Tony. We're like, this is so fun. So like, oh, we went, so we, I went to go see the show and sure enough, Kyle Riavko was the lead. Was oh, nothing. that's awesome. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just played with them. And so like, we hung out afterwards and it was cool. Yeah. How long were you on it? Um, I think I did it for... I was on it till it closed. Oh, okay. It wasn't, I wasn't a full year. I think I was in it for like eight months, maybe eight, nine months. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was a big and part then, of, yeah, uh, my, yeah, it was a big part of my life for a while. Yeah. Like eight shows a week. Was that your first Broadway yeah, show? Yeah, my first Broadway show. Cool. So it was cool. Um, and then how long were you in New York after that before you moved out to LA? Um, still quite a bit longer. Uh, okay. I went on to, I did the show August Osage County oh, yeah. after that. And then I, um, let's see, maybe a year or two after that, I got Walking Dead. So then I was still in New York, but I was doing a lot of like flying back and forth between Atlanta and New York. And then eventually got a place in Atlanta. And then it was still, once I left Walking Dead, 
it was still another year or so before I moved to LA. So I've been Washington in LA shoots about in Atlanta. Yeah, it shoots okay. in Atlanta. So I would just cool. um, it's a pretty quick flight from New York to Atlanta. But I did have like an apartment there too. Mm. Um, but it was still like a year or so after Walking Dead. I guess it'd be like 2016 that I moved to yeah. LA. So was that. For you, um, moving from stage to screen, was that something, was that always part of the plan? Because I feel like, you know, you go out to New York, you get such a huge Broadway role, like you could have easily just gone that route for a while, I would imagine. I don't know. What were, the, what were those decisions like and why did you choose to start auditioning uh, for, for TV and film? Yeah, um, I mean, it wasn't really... I mean, I started auditioning for theater first because that was what was available to me. Like, that's okay. what I could pick up backstage and go to sh open calls. And then once I got my... Um, and then even before I got Spring Awakening, I was auditioning for TV and would mm. do little, you know, like I did like a guest role on Law & Order and stuff like that. So that was kind of like weaved throughout my theater stuff. Um, did you have an agent when you first went out to New York? I didn't. Um, so my first show, very first professional show, I just got literally through a audition and backstage. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> that open I, call. Yeah, just yeah, a, open oh, call. Wow. I got it. Cool. When it closed, I didn't know what to do. I went back to Nebraska for a second, moved back to New yeah. York City. And then um, and then eventually I, I got pretty – I did get some casting directors that would start calling me in for TV stuff. And then that's mm -hmm. how I – was able to eventually get a um a an agent um when and they TV... and then sorry, they started really you know sending me out equally as much in theater gotcha. as in like tv film and so I just kind of like learned as I went I hadn't really had like a lot of training I guess but mm. I remember reading like tons of interviews because I was like oh I felt like I needed to know I felt really comfortable on stage just because I'd been mm -hmm. doing it since I was like in high school and like singing and sure. all this is. um but maybe on camera I felt a little more like so I remember just like reading you know, just so I would know if there was something I was missing or, you know, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, when you, uh, so like what you said, you TV director started calling you in for, uh, for, for auditions. Uh, how are they, how do they discover, like, how do they know to call you? How did they, know um, well, uh, well, it's like, well, there's a group of just casting directors. And so they usually okay. cast like a few things, like maybe they cast a theater show, but they also cast the guest oh. stars on this TV show. So cool. there was one casting director in particular. So maybe I would come in for an open call and get really close to getting something. So they'd yeah. sort of like remember me. And then uh. I'd literally just get a phone call from them and be like, hey, we wanted to bring you in. There's one in particular, cool. um, Henry Russell Bernstein. Bernstein? Um, I, I hope that's how you say the last name. Anyway, he's lovely. And he brought me in for Gossip Girl okay. and obviously didn't get Gossip Girl, but got down to the last little bit where I got to like meet the producers and all this stuff. And cool. I remember going into the sign in sheet and I said to him, you know, everyone on this sheet has an agent. Like I should yeah. get an agent. He was like, yeah, <laughs> why don't you email someone and get an agent? So I started wow. just like emailing around and I had a few actor friends who had agents and, um, yeah, and eventually met, you know, yeah. my agents. Yeah. So, so that's what's so interesting is because, um, you know, it, that's how the acting world works. And I have a lot of friends who are actors, and I, I like, I kind of get it. It's, it. it's pretty much like more or less a straight line. You, you, uh, you get an agent. You know, you for theater, you can go to open calls. You know, you audition, you get the part, you don't get the part, and you get the part, and then you just kind of like show up when they tell you to show up. You do your best learning the stuff, and it's like it's pretty straightforward. And I, I did, I, I dipped my toes into acting out here for a minute, a hot minute. I did, um, so I kind of like got to know how that process went, um, a little bit. And it was, it's so fascinating to me because music, you know, there is no straight line, and there's a hundred different no. ways to make a, a career happen in the new music business. And uh, I'm curious. How did you approach um, kind of running your music career alongside your acting career uh, when acting 
like did did those battles happen with you or were you like man there isn't there a straight line like do i get an agent for music like how does that like you know how did you learn to do all that okay definitely like all <laughs> these things you're bringing up are like conver well first of all i would say for the actor it probably doesn't feel like what you're i know what you're saying and that has actually helped me so much it being like okay well you go and you get the job and even if the show sucks you still get paid for your time it's sort of like you can you can sort of and there's also an actor's union. So there's sort of rules that you sort of, you get used to, you know, mm -hmm. um, certain things like um, as far as like what you're going to get paid and stuff, there's at least like that level thing. Sure. Um, what you're going to pay your agents. Like that was one thing in music that was so confusing to me because with acting, it was always the same, 10%. Right. And then with music, you know, you have managers who are like, I take 50%, but I put money <laughs> into your career. I, you know, right. I definitely know ones that do that. Um, oh God, so, run away from the managers but that I say wasn't, they take 50%. No, <laughs> I know ones who have done that, but I, no. but like, but here's the thing, like for, when I started doing music, I think I was just so excited to, I feel like discovering writing songs was really exciting for me. And because there is this structure with acting, you also spend a lot of time waiting around, right? Mm. You're, you're on set, you're waiting till it's your turn sometimes all day, you know? Sure. And then auditions, you do the auditions and so many people are like, did you get it? It's like, I don't know. When are they going to let you know? <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Like I've literally gone to auditions and then like months later be like, you know that thing you auditioned for like months ago, you got it or you know oh what I mean? Like, right, so yeah. you kind of have to like let it go a little bit. Sure. But in that interim, mm -hmm. I wanted to be creative and have some kind of, I f it makes you feel like you don't have control over your career mm, because yes. you're always waiting for someone to say, it's your turn. Yes. Um, so for me in that way, music was fun because I could, once I started writing songs and that was all really exciting, I could call up Rockwood. I remember my friend Simon who was like, oh, you, I, you need to meet this guy, you know, yeah. this guy, I'll email him. You could, you should do a show at Rockwood, you know? Yeah. And um, I could set up a show and perform and it was fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But once I got past that, you're right. As it started to become more of a job or more of something I was, t a career, yeah. I was very confused. And I was so used to the acting way of there being these standards yes. that I was like, wait, this person said this, this manager takes 20%. I didn't know right. that was, and they're like, it's standard. I'm like, is it standard? Right. <laughs> is, I don't know. Like, like where the, you know, there's no, and then it was like, oh, every, you need to play, pay this for publicity. Oh, but this place it's only like 500 bucks a month for you know like what's right. the right thing to do and I was constantly right. I would say the first bit of putting out music I was constantly trying to be like I was so used to gatekeepers in acting mm. you know and there is a little bit of that yes. in the music industry but it can also be like not like you can also right. you know I know you had the the guy from Patreon on your thing. You know, you could yeah, also, yeah. you could just start an online business and sell your music and be like, Spotify, I don't want you to have my music. Um, all right. my fans, you could literally just make yeah. it your own little, I know you somebody decide. who does that. There's a, yeah. uh, what's her, Shannon Curtis, she, uh, she makes her living doing house concert touring and she doesn't put her music on Spotify for a year after she actually releases the album because she sells so many CDs, still CDs, literally like still, because, yeah. they're, because they're like looking for a souvenir and they still want the thing. And yeah. so what she does is like, she makes six figures just doing house concerts every year and her music, a lot of it isn't even on streaming services. And if you were to look up her digital presence, you'd be like, oh, man, she must not have a career. She's not doing anything. It's like, well, on the flip side, she's actually doing better than a majority of the musicians out there. And it, it's like so interesting how, you know, there are so many different ways that you can run that. And there aren't really that many standards. Yeah. And I think um, at the, and, but yet there are these bigger, you know, like labels and different things that make you yes. feel like, or if you go, oh, well, I'm successful if I'm on the radio. Okay, well, then I need to get on the radio. Like you start to not really know, I, like, I think I reached out to you when I read your book, yeah. maybe, but I, but I remember like one thing where it was like, well, like figuring out what your actual goals are, how do you want it to fit into your life? Mm -hmm. And then, and then deciding what like success means, because like, if you think that it's this other like thing, you're just chasing, you know, if you're like, if you're mm -hmm. letting other people decide 
what it means to be successful, you know, then it's, yes. I don't know if that's exactly what you said it exactly. better. Well, yeah, no, but like uh, the, no. the idea that like the only way to, to be successful is like to be a big, huge rock star. And it's like, right. that might not even be uh, like, well, there's no, no, it. yeah, no one can define success for you. Yeah. And you know, success is extremely personal. And so there are, there are people out there who will say, you know, oh, well, you're not successful until you get uh, a million streams on Spotify, or you're not successful until you get like, you know, 10 million followers on Instagram or, or whatever. And it's yeah. kind of like, I know people with 10,000 followers on Instagram making really, really good livings doing music, and you would have no idea. And so yeah. it's like, but it's like, what is your definition of success? And that's, that's you know, really what it comes down to. And, and I think where a lot of people trip up themselves is they allow other people to define success for them. And so yeah. they're constantly chasing those things that actually aren't really meaningful to them personally because everyone else told them that's what they're supposed to do, even though there really is no supposed to's or have to's in the new music yeah. business. And that's like, it's, it's exciting, but it's also very daunting because like there really isn't that kind of a straight line and like i'm sure it's funny because like I, I yeah like you were saying i know there are probably actors who don't think it's very set up or a straight line and you know but there but are it, very specific gatekeepers like you get the jobs and you know you audition you get the part you get paid you know how much you're getting paid yada 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 it's all set up with music it's like man you don't have to get a record deal you don't have to get a booking agent you don't even have to get a manager and you can still have a successful career it's like in acting if you don't really have an agent, it's going to be very, very, very challenging for you to have actually a successful career. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, with music, also the, the you know, if you wanted, if you're one of those people who's like, wait, I want to do this right and I want to, like, get the part and, mm -hmm. you know, it, like you said, it's going to be um, frustrating and I do think I... I at first was frustrated many times because I'd be like, I want to do this right. Mm. But what I realized was, is like, oh, I was trying to win, win some part. And, right. and that's not really what it is. Like mm -hmm. that's not, there's an, and it also keeps changing, you know, like what was special, you know, getting a record deal maybe would seem like really important however many years ago and right. now maybe like you said getting a million streams on Spotify feels or maybe now that's not even a thing anymore like right. you know what that marker is of being like I won the part or I'm I'm good yeah and established that keeps changing yes. and so it's very frustrating if you're going to define it by these other things like right. I almost think these new things that come out like if a new not Spotify but the new whatever is next mm -hmm. for music it's like you have to go like, well, that's just a tool. Am I going to use it or not? Not so much like, is mm -hmm. this, a, you know, like, oh, that's the new thing. I have to chase it. Absolutely. Also, it's just I no love... fun. Like, Yes. <laughs> it's totally. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I love you call it. No, absolutely. It's a tool. And that's so important for people to understand and realize is that Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and even Spotify, these are all tools to assist you in running your music career. And if you want to use them, you can. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how you want to set up your career. But it's also like you touch on, is that fun? Which is so important because like, you know, personally, I think that success is is defined in, in happiness. It's like per, for me, like mm -hmm. I I look at success as like, am I happy? And, and I think that's like a really you know, um, it can seem quite nebulous to some people, but it, that's why it's so personal because it's like, you know, is, it, does money make you happy? Well, it, it, you know, it, it, up to a point maybe, but at the end of the day, it's like, is what I'm doing making me happy? And if so, then I feel like I'm successful because everyone's bar of uh, threshold for success or, uh, you know, it is different. And some people it's like, well, I don't think I'm going to be successful until I am a millionaire or da, 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 or yeah. I have a house or two houses or five houses, or I don't have, you know, and it's kind of, but really, uh, I think personally it's, it's, it's simplified in, am I happy? Yeah. And really it's all about, you know, enjoying 
the journey, like one thing I think yes. that's helped me a lot is um, that someone, I'm trying to think, well, it started with one of my roommates way back, my roommate Elizabeth, but imagining, mm-hmm. you know, if you're like not feeling like you're where you want to be, like with your music or whatever, like you're like, mm-hmm. well, what would be like the perfect day in your life as like a musician, like waking mm-hmm. up and like, are you on a tour bus or are you at home and you're like making music, you know, in your studio in the backyard with your friends Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you're playing, you know what I mean? Like what like gets you feeling like good and excited. And it doesn't mean that you can't change your mind. It doesn't mean if a song takes off, you can't change your mind and be like, no, I want the tour bus. It just means that like, it just means that like you are saying like what actually feels good and reachable and like, yeah, I mean, like mm-hmm. we said, I think it's just so easy to get caught up in like these um, mm-hmm. outside goals. Um, I also think there is just another difference between the acting and music that I, when it comes to like all the things like management and agents, I think that those things became overwhelming for me too because it does become really difficult to trust what everyone's job is. And mm-hmm. even though you can feel like, oh, all these musicians have like they have a band and they have a publicist and they have all these different things you might not need all those different things and like also you have to think about if that person's actually adding value because Mm -hmm. one thing that I've been like the victim of basically is being involved like I I did pledge and all that money just they took it oh no you got caught up in the pledge music scandal my whole my whole last album I'm so sorry yeah, I mean, it's so much Fuck. money, but like, oh, <laughs> basically, God. I had already sent out the merch, sent out everything. But I started going like, why did I feel like I needed like one way that they pitched me was they were like, we're going to be because I had said, I don't really want to do like a I don't want to do like a Kickstarter. Fun- I want it to be more of like they were yeah. going to do these things to help promote it and whatever. Um, anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, all they were really doing was becoming the middleman. They weren't really adding a lot mm. of value. And so they were able to sort of just like right. take my money, take their, and they didn't just take their percentage. They took all of it, but they took all of it. They right. took all of it. But I really think you have to be careful of that in the music business. Cause there's a lot of people yeah. that are like, I'm a, this, I'm a consultant. I need a percentage. Do right. they need a percentage? Do you just pay them up an upfront fee? And you can decide what you're comfortable with. Yes. And you can say no. Like, I've also felt like different times people will be like, well, this is what, you know, a guitar player usually gets paid at what da 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 And that's great that they are able to say, this is what I deserve. But you can mm-hmm. also say as an artist, well, I can only afford to pay this much. And if you don't want to do it, that's okay. Yeah. You yes. know, or can we meet in the middle? You just like... Everyone, I think as an artist, you do want to please people, but you have to say like, but what can I actually afford to give up here? And Mm -hmm. is the person I'm paying adding a ton of value? Maybe it's worth it for that very special guitar player to pay them their thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mm -hmm. it it probably is, you know, or maybe it's not. Maybe you don't need as big a band as you thought you did for a show at Hotel Cafe, you know? Right. Like, I think standing up for, like, Remembering that there are no rules. You're literally making them. Maybe yeah. you only pay your manager 10% and that's your mm. rule because yeah. that's the amount of value they bring. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I know absolutely. that sounds mean or not. No, it doesn't no. No, look at me. I'm like, oh, that's mean. But 10% <laughs> is standard in acting. Right. So that's, that, I mean, you know, like, thing. it's like there are no rules. Mm-hmm. There's no rules. So you get to decide and maybe you don't know right. what they are yet, but that's where like having friends and asking mm-hmm. and like your book are so important. And I don't know. I feel like mm-hmm. every day I'm like calling up people being like, I don't know what the fuck to do about this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And, and that's the thing. I mean, like we're constantly reinventing uh, the standards every day and creating new standards and, You know, there are people who it came out a few years ago that Bruno Mars and I I think even Taylor Swift fired their entire management uh, companies and just hired a staff. And it was like, Hmm. you know, instead of paying a commission, it's like, I'm just going to hire a staff to do these jobs and roles. Why not? Especially when you're at that level. It's like 
you're going to pay someone a very fair wage salary and you know people would kill for those jobs and positions it's like why give up 10 20 percent whatever when you can pay them a very fair salary like that's an argument too and it's it's just it's just because it because some things have been done a certain way forever doesn't mean they need to still be done that way yeah and that's what's kind of exciting but also very challenging and confusing about the music industry right now yeah and it's a lot i mean that means you also have to be somewhat like business minded and maybe yes. Like, I know for me, I go like, well, I don't want to be business minded. I want to write a song and like, yeah. I don't really, this stuff overwhelms me. So like figuring out a way to like, you know, even if it's certain times you're like, okay, this is the day I'm going to like tackle this or, you mm. know, How do I don't you know. handle that? Because I, everybody has a different process. I, I'm curious, do you find yourself... Uh, are you business minded? Do you does does the business come naturally and easy to you? I mean, you read my book, so you, at least you have like some, you know, yeah, uh, hit, like it, the business. Um, you're interested in in some respect and realm. Um, but are you like, do you bring on a team to help you with that? How does that work when it comes to your music career? Um, yeah, it's something I'm I'm interested in because I feel like it's something I'm going to do my whole life as far as like mm. being, um, and I don't know if it will always be, no, I'm willing to come up with new ideas and stuff, but I think, I think at the beginning I wanted to just offload everything to other people. Like sure. when it came to music, cause I was actually, work, that's when I was working on Walking Dead. It was my first EP that I released just happened to be right when I got my job on Walking Dead. And, mm. um, I didn't really know what I was doing and I found music managers and they really helped me out. And I, um, I really let them sort of take care of things. But then as it went along, I realized that I was in the dark about different things or things would fall through. And I'd be like, what happened there? And like, is that mm. standard? Like that's thing that we're saying, <laughs> like, like, wait, are, do I need to pay a public? Like, what's the point of paying the public? You know, like, what am I giving yeah. up if I sign this distribution deal exactly? Right. Um, and so as things have gone along, honestly, and as I've like made mistakes and been hurt, I guess, I've been like, I need to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. if I'm gonna keep doing it and it making me happy and making me happy, yeah. but I would say I I do tend to unfortunately, like I know it's a weak spot for me. Like that some of that stuff I go like, Ugh, I don't want to like look at yeah. that right now, or like I don't really care mm -hmm. in a way. Like I mean yeah. I care, but I don't. It doesn't get me as excited as the song. <laughs> I, I, I feel you. I, I think I, a lot of artists can relate to that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, I mean, I, I wrote the fucking book on the music business and there are days <laughs> I don't want to do the fucking music business. I'm, I'm like, you know, yeah. I'm an artist too. Like, I, I get that. And um, it's like, you know, th there are when, my songwriting days, like, I, I take those days, those days are sacred for me. Mm -hmm. Like I won't even look at my phone when I wake up if it's a songwriting day for me because I don't like, it's so hard for me to go to, to start thinking about business and then flip that switch to start thinking about art and songwriting and, and try to get that inspiration going. I can go the other way. Like after a day of songwriting, like I can do some business stuff or emails yeah. or whatever, but I can't go thinking about the business and then flip my brain to go into a songwriting session. That's just me. And, uh, you know, so when I'm, when I, it's a songwriting day for me, I, I, it's, it's sacred and, and I have a full on routine on how I'm going to approach the songwriting. Um, but then I also designate the times to do the business. And I, I think, you know, everybody has to kind of figure out how they want to integrate, um, the business into their life and, and what, how that process is going to work for them. And, you know, because everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And yeah. I, I know that I have a lot of weaknesses, but I also know that uh, some of my weaknesses uh, are crucial in that they need to get done. 
and so for instance like i'm not a good graphic design artist and i'm i'm a very very mediocre video editor i'm just i'm not very good uh so i know when i but i, I can't just ignore that there needs to be graphics done or videos need to be made but I know that like, I'm gonna get support and help for those jobs and those processes. And it's like, it goes all the way up the and down the spectrum. It's like, I booked an entire tour. Uh, I saw you that you had uh, Ron Pope on your uh, on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, did a, we did a 60 day tour together that I booked. Because That's like, awesome. <laughs> like, you know, it was one of his first you could tours. Do Cause I could do that. And I'm like, yeah. I know how to do this. And like, this is a strength of mine. I can do this. Yeah. I'm gonna book it. And Ron came to me because he's like, you know, all right, I, I don't know how to do this. I see you're touring all the time. Like, could you book us a tour? I'm like, absolutely. I'll book the tour for us. No problem. That sounds fun for me. You know? Yeah. And, but like, that's a strength of mine. That's not for many people. And so I think it's like so important to identify your strengths and weaknesses, but also more so identify what you, what needs to get done with the current goals that you have set out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's why setting goals is so important because everyone's goals are different and you can't allow other people to say, oh, well, your goal should be this. It's like, well, maybe I don't want that to be my goal. But if you do have a goal, then you set up your goal and you're like, how can I achieve this goal? Once you learn how to achieve it, then you're like, okay, I can handle this part of this, of, of achieving this goal. But I know that yeah. there are these three other things that I'm not good at, but they need to get done. So I'm going to outsource. And I think like that's a really a way to kind of put the p put the puzzle together in how you're going to achieve every goal that you want to achieve and there's no way like you know people call me uh the poster child of diy music but like i haven't done anything all by myself ever it's like yeah. you just you know identify what parts um you can do yourself and then what parts you need help with yeah that's great i mean then yeah. you're not also exhausting your energy doing the thing that like you know because yes. those are the, the, that drain you and like finding people to fill those roles that you like really trust and have yeah. the same vibe and everything. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm always still like as I go, you know, you get like yeah. better at figuring that stuff out, I guess. Totally. Totally. Well, Emily, thank you so much. This has been a very uh, enlightening, insightful, very interesting conversation. Um, yeah. I'm glad we had it. I, I There's one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Um, okay. And we've been talking about this now for quite a bit, but I'm curious to hear your your take on it. Um, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? I think my ultimate goal is, I always say my ultimate goal is like to be able to continue to do it. Like I'm not trying to like yeah. take over the world. So for me to make it means to build a group of true fans hmm. and a team that truly understands you and your different visions and, and things like that. Real fans that are lifers. Hmm. Yeah. And um, getting to a point where knowing that you can continue to make albums and reflect on your life mm -hmm. as we grow older. And Wonderful. that there's someone, there's a real fan base there to support you in doing that. Love it. Cool. Well, Emily, thank you so much. Uh, it's great. It's great chatting with you. And uh, yeah, thank soon. you.